on call. And um, um, well, uh, long call, uh, uh, good, good evening to you and good morning from uh, some of us here in, uh, in Asia. Um, two days ago, it was your birthday and um, I thought we'd take this occasion to uh, offer our respectful greetings to you and pay respects and seek for forgiveness before we begin, if that's all right with you, long call. Sure. Okay, so uh, brothers and sisters in the Dharma, uh, some of you may be aware that it was Long Paul's uh, 75th, 75th birthday uh, two days ago. And uh, on this occasion, it's um, very nice for us to be gathering here virtually uh, in the presence of the Noble One. Uh, if, and if we can all uh, put our palms together and let us all pay respects to Long Paul three times. And um, what we'll do is I'll lead us all in uh, requesting for forgiveness uh, and if we can also imagine Long Paul in our presence physically, uh, and we then offer him our best and well wishes. Okay, all right. So um, with, with palms and in a jelly, let us all now uh, pay three respects. First, first bow. Second bow. And third bow. If we could all now um, chant Namo Tassa together. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Please bow and put your uh, head in a low position. Mahate re pamadena duaratene nakatam sabam aparatam kamatunobante. Mahate re pamadena duaratene nakatam. Sabang aparatam kamatu no bante. Mahate re ma pramadena. Duarate me nakatam. Sabang aparatam kamatu no bante. Um, Lampo, we can't hear you. You're muted, Lampo. Aham kamami tumhe hibime kamitu pang. Aham bandi. Bhavatu sabha mangalang rakhantu sabha devata sabha buddha sabha dhamma sabha sankhanu bhavena sadasuti bhavanti te. Sadhu. May you be well and happy. Let us all now come about three times to know. Very nice, thank you. <clears throat> now, Paul, shall we now begin with a uh, short guided meditation? Okay, I'll, I'll get that going. <clears throat> so let's meditate for, I'll set the clock for half an hour. I'll give a bit of instruction and then uh, you, you have your own ways of meditating, that's fine, but we'll, we use a half hour to enter into the silence of heart. Always a good thing to do. So take a posture that is comfortable. That you can sustain pretty well for half an hour without moving much. So you're not restless. <clears throat> and bring your attention into the present moment. 
into the body and just feel your body sitting here. So let the body become conscious and awareness. And the notice when, as soon as you make that kind of intention, you notice the stillness of awareness. So awareness has no real quality. And, and the, the stillness of knowing is what we're cultivating. And we use objects to remember the stillness of awareness, the stillness of knowing. So listen to sound. And let the sound come to you. And don't worry about the quality of the sound, but pay attention to the stillness of knowing, awareness of sound. And then feel your hands, feel both hands. Allow the feelings in the hands to become conscious. And there's the stillness of knowing. Go back to sound. Allow sound to become conscious. And again, the stillness of knowing. So the stillness of knowing doesn't change. Sense objects change. So meditation, what I try to do is remember the stillness of knowing, irrespective of the object. So whether it's the breath or whatever, it doesn't matter so much. So feel the breathing of your body. Allow breathing to become conscious. And notice the stillness of knowing. You know you're breathing. Breathe a bit more deeply. Expand your breath. Does the stillness of knowing change? Now breathe more shallow, just a little breath. Does the stillness of knowing change? Listen to sound. Notice sound, let it be conscious. Is the stillness of knowing different? Feel your hands. Feel your breath. So you can see there's something that's changing, sense experience. And then the knowing, the stillness of knowing. So this is what we're cultivating, this recognition of the stillness of knowing. So it's not the same as concentrating on the object. That's when you're trying to hold your attention on the object. Here you're trying to notice awareness itself. So the quality of the practice is to notice the still awareness. Now take the breathing and then stay with the breathing. Let the breathing be what it is. Let it be conscious. But now it's a, it's, it's a pointer to the stillness of knowing rather than it being important in, in of itself. So it's not so much about the breathing, although the breathing is helpful because it's going on right now. So stillness of knowing for one in breath. Stillness of knowing for one out breath. So it's a relaxed and receptive sustaining of that attitude of stillness knowing. It is very, very simple. And then what, what is complicated is thought, memory, planning, worry. And when you notice all of that, then return to the stillness of knowing. Don't try to get rid of thought. 
Just be patient. And then return to the breath. Stillness of knowing what in breath. Stillness of knowing what out breath. And just let it proceed in that way. Okay, let's just sit in silence then and appreciate that stillness of knowing.
preaching to them. We shall now request the Dhamma talk. Brahma Charoka Dipati Sahantati Tatanjali Anadivara Ayajata Santi Dasata Rajakat Desa to Dhamma Anukantiman Ajan Namo tasa papavato varato sama samputasa. Namo tasa papavato varato sama samputasa. Namo tasa papavato arahato sama samputasa. Bhutang damang sanghang namasang. Hello again, everyone. Many people have sent me birthday wishes, so thank you. And uh, the uh, friends in Singapore even sang happy birthday. But William, I think you need more practice. <laughs> it's a good try. No, it's very sweet of you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, I am 75. It's an interesting one, isn't it? So there's certainly the passport which says 75. I don't have a birth certificate. My parents are refugees, so somehow I got lost, but I think I was born. Seems, seems apparent. And then of course the you can see pictures of me at age, whatever you want. And some, some of the pictures of me at the age of 20, you wouldn't want to look at. And then you could, you can even see a video of me some, at some point. And certainly I can feel bodily aches which fit a 75 year old body. In fact, I just made a wrote yesterday. He wished me a happy birthday. And he cheekishly said, may you live to be 120. <laughs> so that's 45 more years, right? I better get my knees in shape for that. So <laughs> I am 75 and there's, there's proof there. And yet when you, when you try to find the I within those different perceptions and histories, you can't find anything, can you? It's really curious. So on one hand, I could say, like I, I my when I get off the floor, I look like a arthritic giraffe. <laughs> Not so graceful anymore. If you know it, I'll be used to all of you who are over 25, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's not so pretty. Um, and yet, so, so there is the body and there are perceptions and there are memories and all of that is going on. So there's this whole experience of me. And yet when I say to myself, I am 75, my mind goes silent. So is there something kind of separate called me and the experiences of knees and perceptions and histories and all of that? Does, does that actually exist? Well, there is consciousness. That's, that's true. So that I can't deny, presence, consciousness. But then this extra thing called I, I can never find it. And that, that's not being, you know, it's not like giving you kind of a Buddhist doctrine of an anatta, but it's a kind of very serious spiritual inquiry to, to 
look at that assumption that I am a person called Viradamo in time and that I was born and that I will die. That's the usual identity and that's a necessary identity really. And it's not that it's wrong, it's a convention that's true. So, you know, I do have a passport and I do uh, have a health card and uh, all the rest and I wear glasses and I need the right prescription. So to, to not deny that, uh, and in fact, to honor that, and that's very, very important. It's important to take care of the body and to fulfill my responsibilities and such like. But, it, but is, that, is that all there is? Is there only like this worldly um, experience, which is sometimes up and down, happy and sad and so on? Is, that, is, there, is there not another, is there not something we're missing? And this might... You know, this is, I think, what the Buddha was talking about in his realization or his enlightenment, that if you only identify with your, with your personal history, if you only identify with your nationality, with your, with your body type, with your gender, with, the, with your memories of things you did well and did not do well, if that is your only identity, then I would say we're missing something. If you don't honor that, then you're missing something too. So if I don't honor that this body is 75 and it shouldn't be go, going on the roof and working on the tiles on the roof, then I'll fall down and hurt myself. And, and, and that they don't have the, so that's, that's true. But, the, but the, to me, like a lot of people will, well, one of the common things I find people say, well, I'm not religious. I don't like religion. All right. Go for it. That's the kind of modern take on it. But then I say, but they, they also say to me, but I am spiritual. And so I say, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by spiritual? And quite often they'll just say, well, you know. <laughs> well, no, we don't know. What, what do you actually mean by that? Like, it's a, it's a, it's a popular phrase to use. I am spiritual. And of course, we'll, we'll have that in our, in our dialogue about, yeah, there's spirituality, but, but what could that be? Well, to me, it seems it's that inquiry into the very sense of beingness that brings you to that which is spiritual. To do that, to do that, you have to live a good life, obviously. You know, one has to live a, a life which, is, which has uh, impeccability in it. A life which is, you know, where we don't harm other beings, where we don't harm this body, where we respect uh, the rule of law or we respect nature. That's all part of a, a good life because without that, life is just very confusing and, and the memory system gets all messed up with foolish behavior. And, and, and Buddhism always lays that out first, that if you want to do this work, if you want to live this path, it's terribly important that, your, that our social dimension is well cared for. And that is the dimension of not being selfish. Because if, if, if it was only introspection, then like the whole spiritual life could become very narcissistic and self-concerned all the time. But that, that, that doesn't work either, because that's still a kind of ego, ego kind of uh, attitude. So the, the laying out a foundation of moral impeccability or ethical responsibility is very important. And it leads to a lot of, of uh, stability of mind and well-being and a lack of remorse. And, and the heart's kind of open to life because it hasn't transgressed the laws of nature and the laws of, of, of our, 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 our mutual dependence on each other and other things. Um, and then there's our whole, um, the, the psychology of our being, our whole emotion, all the emotional tones and moods that we experience and all the likes and dislikes and all of, all of that uh, inner, both turmoil and joy, all of that, that needs to be understood too. Because if we're just fraught with our emotional reactions to life, then we're always just kind of out there being 
like a leaf in the wind being stimulated by things or being upset by things. And there's no real stability for uh, a deeper spiritual inquiry. So this is psychology, or this is the, the hindrances in Buddhism, or greed, hatred, and delusion, all these ways we talk about that. And each of us has our own condition. So my own, my own life was very much filled with a lot of fear, and um, liberating that fear from the heart has freed, uh, kind of freed the capacity for me to pay attention and inquire into the kind of spiritual aspect. Other people have a lot of anger. Other people, you know, I suffer from a lot of self-doubt or, uh, or other people have had really rough, rough childhoods and, and you know, they deal with all kinds of um, difficult self-hatreds. And then you have things like self-harming. So that inner world can be very, very complex. And, and it's, it's very important to, to under, understand that and each of us works in our own way. And I found that, like, like for me, because my training with Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedha was to, to actually use the inner turmoil as a way of developing stronger awareness, rather than just trying to fix it. Uh, actually seeing that the, the, the fears that I suffered from as a young man were things that would strengthen my awareness. Now, before that, I thought that, well, I need to get rid of the fear so that I have no fear in the heart, so that my mind's clear and I'll be, you know, I'll be free in some kind of a way. But that was that was always a kind of me trying to get rid of something, me trying to become something else. That never worked. But when I when I began to take refuge in awareness, irrespective of the objective experience, then I began to see, oh yeah, yeah. Awareness is possible within the most horrible kinds of fears or within the most beatific kinds of love, that awareness is this possibility, this, this constant possibility. And that's the training I always had from Lompo Sumedho, Lompo Cha, be the knowing, they would say, be aware. I use the word objects a lot when I talk about Dhamma. And by objects, I, I don't mean just flowers and, and cushions and trees and people. Not just that, but it's all, all of experience is objective. So all the sounds that I hear, they are objects in awareness. Dynamic objects, I would say objects sound very static, but all the, all the smells that I experience, they are objects in awareness. All the uh, visual images that I see, or mental images that I see, they are objects in awareness. All the tactile feelings, they are objects in awareness. All the emotions, uh, all the memories, all the planning, all the analysis, all the thought, they're all objects in awareness. They come and they go according to causes and conditions. And being a, a human being on the planet, I have to figure out how to live with objects, how to live with the objects of nature, the objects of consciousness, of my own inner experience. But can objects, can experience itself ever really fulfill you? So what's fulfillment for you? I mean, how would you, it's a common word we use, what would fulfillment mean? Well, for me, it was, and it's always been, uh, uh, a sense of not needing anything. A sense of peacefulness, a sense of, of deep love for the way things are. And so the Buddhist teaching was very, very good for me because it, it didn't tell me how to do that. It told me what was getting in the way. And what was getting in the way was my preoccupation with objects. And how was I preoccupied with objects? It was always through fear, through, for me, let's say, I don't know for about you, what, what you know, if I just, Think back 75 years, what were the, what were the real compelling uh, objects that um, preoccupied my attention? And they were fear, uh, self-disparagement. Um, sure, there was, there was lust and greed, but the dominant ones were very much uh, self-hatred, fear, 
anxiety, um, and then the, the, the other kind of minor obsessions. But the major theme, the major drama was, was around that. And once I, once I began to be able to witness fear as an object, rather than be the subject, then I realized that's the way. Because now I'm emphasizing awareness rather than the objective experience of fear. And that's what I was trying, so I always tried to do actually, when I asked you to listen to sound and then feel the breath and then toggle between the two, listen to sound, feel the breath. And, I, and, I'm, and what I'm emphasizing is the stillness of knowing rather than the objective experience. You know, I always talk that way. And, and when you do that, when you emphasize the knowing rather than the sound itself, when you emphasize that, to me, that's the gateway to the spiritual. Objects are the gateway to the world. And so that's where desire functions. The, the function of desire is that you you know, that you're comfortable, you take care of the body, that you feed it. The, the, the function of desire is that you care for your family and, and, and you take care of the animal. The function of desire is to make sure you don't, um, like this morning, it was one degree, really cold wind. Make sure you don't catch cold, you're a dumb old. <laughs> You're an old man now. This is the function of desire. Right? That's its function. But can desire ever, ever, be really fulfilling desire for objects that is we all we all have an aspiration to spiritual life i think that's where we're here well, well desire itself what is it what is desire seeking what is desire seeking isn't it desirelessness isn't it is it what desire is looking for it's looking for the end of itself kind of thing isn't desirelessness what we what, where we find peace because if you look at desire desire is that really going out into the objective world and it's necessary i'm not saying it's not but does it ever end does like the objective experience that we have it keeps changing right it keeps shifting you feel satisfied for one little bit and then there's a shift because because the fulfillment through desire can never never be still because it's always dependent on emotions, on social situations, on your body being a certain way, on the weather being right, and having enough salad oil on your salad. <laughs> or, you know, whatever you want, whichever way you want to go. Um, so whether it's salad dressing or a broken leg, um, the, the life, the objective world is very contingent. Having dealt with that, you see that, that, that Anything that changes and is contingent on other things, um, you, you, you'll never find freedom there. You'll never find the spiritual there. And so what do you have? What do you have left? What do you have left? Well, you have this ineffable knowing. So when I ask myself, uh, or when I say to myself, I am 75 years old, and I say, well, yeah, yeah okay, who is the I? Where is that I? My mind goes silent. All I have is knowing. That's all that's left. Now, is that sufficient? Well, for desire, it's not sufficient. Because desire is that which is always going into objects. So I ask the question, who is 75 years old? And then I was very silent. And then my foot itches. <laughs> so then I scratch my foot. And then what? And then I think, oh, it's a really nice cake for lunch. Maybe we'll have some tomorrow. A lot of cake, enough cake. <laughs> and I think, oh, that'd be nice. And, and then I get dull and I fall asleep. So what happens is that clarity of attention quickly, very quickly, gets absorbed into objects, thought. Or, or, or like, like say, just sitting meditation. You're sitting there very, very, very quiet, very bright, and all of a sudden your <laughs> your head's on your chest. You're lost in objects. The objects called dullness, right? So thought and so on. Or or the mind is fantasizing about whatever, or it's regretting something. And so the 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 the, the default mode 
of our conscious experience is distraction. We're distracted by things. Now, when those distractions are, are pleasant, we get absorbed. So, you know, like you like to play sport, you play a game of whatever, or you like to make things, you like to cook, or you like to like videos or um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, whatever, whatever you want. The attention gets absorbed into experience through pleasure, obviously, but can pleasure ever sustain itself? It can't. It can't because it's contingent on all other things. And then you have to look for another one. So, but what about desirelessness? What would that look like? What, what, what might that look like? Well, if you try this, you know, I, I, I recommend people to do lying meditation. And this is a very good way to learn about desirelessness. You, you lay down in, in the lying posture and you do lying meditation. And then you're lying there within, within 30 seconds, you want to scratch yourself or you want to shift. That's desire. It's desire to move, not illegal, not against the precepts. You can move if you want. But what if you were to look at desire as an object in itself? What if you would do that? Well, when you do that in line meditation, because it's not you know, fraught with pain or anything, you see that, that the desire to move ceases. And, and, and you begin to touch desirelessness in a little way, in a little way. And you begin to see, well, the peace of mind that can be with unfulfilled desire. Now, that's interesting. That's interesting. Because it's not dependent on an object. Now, do that with fear. Now, fear isn't like some kind of little itch. Fear is like some serious stuff coming up into the mind. Now, how would you, how would you look at fear in the same way? How could fear lead to desirelessness? Well, the obvious thing is that fear has, has, it is an emotion which is conditioned from various angles and, and causes, but there's a tremendous amount of desire there, the desire not to have fear. So if I make awareness the most important thing and I begin to pay attention to desire and the emotions are difficult or the, the bodily pain is difficult or, or boring or whatever, and I, and I see desire as an object. Well, that's hard to do. But if I see this, this is not only the fear or, or the whatever it is, but there's also the desire around that object. And I, and I can begin to, to kind of pay attention. Well, what does desire feel like? What does it feel like to have something that I don't want or to not want something that I do have? In a reasonable way, not in a way where you hurt yourself or others, just in a reasonable, as a, as a, as a contemplative exercise, very important, very important. So then maybe in, in, in you know, I'm, I'm, well, with, let's say I'm with a group of five, six people, and uh, one of the people is irritated. So there's sound, the object of sound, and for some reason, the object of sound becomes unpleasant because... I don't like the person to have a history of the person. Now, as a, as a meditator, you might kind of, well, if you're really heedless, you just buy into it. You tell the person he's a turkey or you just repress it and then come home all stressed. Okay, that's, that's one way to operate. But what if you then use that very negativity in this sound that you're hearing as a way of looking at desire? So now there's not only six people talking and one impacting you in a negative way. There's also awareness of desire. And what is desire? Shut up. I don't want you to talk. Go away. Drop dead. I, <laughs> may you be well and happy somewhere else. Um, so then, then what are you doing? Now you're emphasizing awareness rather than the desire for this person to be different than they are. Again, I assuming it's not abusive. And, and as you emphasize awareness and you see desire as an object, then desire eventually ceases. And you can be with this person and it might be a bit irritating, but you're, you're, you're centered now in awareness. This is in awareness. And you walk out of that meeting much less stressed, but also what you've strengthened is, is awareness. And as you strengthen awareness, 
you strengthen the gateway to the spiritual. It's hard to do. It's very hard to do. We're, we're just reading the, the biography of Ajahn Chah. I keep mentioning this, but we are now at the last stage of his illness. And very powerful reading because uh, he, he has a, and what we read this morning and yesterday, he has an operation to relieve uh, liquid in his brain. He's got too much uh, liquid in his brain and they, they put a shunt in to his brain down to his stomach. And they want to, you know, after the operation, they want to give him painkillers. He says, no, I, I just want to witness the pain. Whoa. And then he says, um, and I wanted to witness the anesthesia too, but it snuck up on me. <laughs> now, he, you know, this powerful man, powerful man. And, and, but what's he emphasizing? I just want to be aware of it. So his refuge and awareness is so powerful that all conditions arise and cease, no matter how extreme, and he abides as the witness. And that's what, you know, I'm not asking you to give up your meds. Please don't. Um, but but can, you, can you see that, that this witnessing consciousness, this awareness of the way things are, is not really the same as a sense experience? Witnessing no sense experience, certainly. I know that I have pain in my right knee, or I know that sugar tastes sweet, right? But what is that knowing? Is that knowing a quality? And that's what I try to indicate in these meditations. When you're listening to sound and you're receptive, does knowing have a quality? The sound is a quality. Yeah. If the sound were to change, you really have the lawnmower going or someone talking, the sound would change. But this awareness, change to a different quality. And then you take bodily, bodily aches and pains. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't. And if you trust in that, if you trust in that, you, you, you're beginning, this, we say this is the gateway, this, the gateway to the deathless, so the unconditioned or Nibbana or, or God or whatever, you, whatever language you like to use around spirituality. Um, that's the opening, the knowing. And then the pull of sense experience, which you have to respect, is to some extent, not totally, but the fascination with sense objects is the closing of the door. Not totally, because you have to still function. So what we try to do in, in, in what we call our practice is to develop this real foundation in witnessing, irrespective of pleasure and pain, irrespective of liking and disliking. And that becomes what we call the practice. You know, what we say, like if someone is um, having a hard time, their practice clicked in. But that's, that's what we mean by that. And it doesn't mean that we're always loving or, or really super together or whatever. It just means witnessing the way things are. If you, if, if you, if you do that and you keep that inquiry going, then there are times which are not. Uh, emotionally impacted. There are times where, you know, things are very neutral. That's a very important time to actually strengthen that. Because when things get neutral and get boring, people, they do something to get rid of the boredom. But you really want to create space in your life and in consciousness. Now inquire into that. Well, who am I? What is this I-75? And if you find a fixed thing, send me an email or send Vita an email. Otherwise, look at if you find a fixed thing called Joe Bloggs or whatever, then uh, you can fire him. <laughs> but what will you find? What, what do you, if you ask right now, what you find? won't you find silence? Now, if you think that the question, who am I, or who is 75 years old or whatever, uh, needs an answer, then that's just another object. And then, of course, you could go on in kind of like infinite infinite mirrors, who said that? I said that, who's I? You know, it's ridiculous. But if you just put that question to yourself once, well, whatever age you are, well, who, who is 75? I am 75, say it, say it, say it. I am 75. Okay, if I do that now, there's perception of sound and sight and body. Sure, that's moving, but is there another piece called I? 
I can't, I can't see it. But there is consciousness, there is awareness. And this is why the spiritual life is so, shall we say, mysterious? Not mysterious in a way that it's trying to dupe you into some kind of dogma or view. It's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle because it's not an object. It is the, the very knowing itself. And abiding as the knowing is what we mean by refuge in Buddha. That's what we're talking about when we say buddhang saranam abiding as witness, abiding as knowing. And trusting in that, that is, 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 is hard to do because our minds love to doubt. Our minds love to think. Our minds love to analyze, which has its place, but not in the spiritual life. The spiritual life is not the answer to a question intellectually. Intellectually, I need to have an answer to, let's say, um, I'm making a, a bed right now and it's made of red oak and I, and I did the side rails and then I need to do the end rails and I measured the end rails and I'm going to cut the tenant. So that's intellect, right? That's where you start to solve a problem, great. But can you, like with, with just knowing the way things are, is that an intellectual exercise of analysis and, and answers and questions? I would say no. I would say it's a remembering. And a simple awakening and sustaining that awake, that awake sense of presence. It's always there. Like the bodily pains that come and go in a 75-year-old body, they come and they go. The, the sounds, they come and they go. The memories and analysis and emotions, they come and they go. What does not come and go? Does witnessing ever really, is it ever not there? Have you ever not been here, wherever here is? <laughs> These are strange questions to ask, but, but what I'm asking is like, what, 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 is, what is the spiritual life for you? Now, you could say, well, I, I believe in something fun. Okay, but then that's just a thought. That's just an idea. So even having like good Buddhist ideas, um, it's just good Buddhist ideas. So this isn't a dogmatic thing. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of, um, I would say it's a, it's a challenge to go beyond intellect. So many Buddhists that I meet, they're so clever. They're really clever. And, you know, they'll, they'll quote stuff from the text. I won't know. I don't know. They'll ask me a word in Pali and say, go oh, beats me. <laughs> um, so sometimes we fool ourselves. As, as, like if you if you read a lot of Buddhism, and Buddhism is a lot of literature, and then commentary of the literature and, and, and so on and so forth. And characters like me put books out. So there's a lot of stuff out there. But is... is can the intellect ever take you to silence? Yes, it can, if you're willing to ask a question and let go of the need for an answer. That's the only way. But analysis will never take you to silence, it will take you to another doubt. So without dismissing intellect, giving its due, what is beyond intellect? Well, I would say it's the knowing. The knowing is not a thought. When I, when I say, this is the sound, is that a thought? No. The analysis of sound, that, oh, that, that sounds, yeah, that sounds like a, a crow. That's thought, that's analysis, that's its place. But just before I make any perceptions or judgments or whatever, what is that? It's silence. So our entry into, into um, the spiritual life, I would say, uh, and the expansion of that is through silent knowing. Now, there's just one problem with that, is that silent knowing that very easily for meditators, and most of us have been meditating for some time, can very much creep into getting rid of thought. This is so common for all of us, because every now and then, the whole thing shuts down. And, oh, thank you. You know, it finally shut up up there. And, you know, you feel so great. Oh, and then blah, I've got it, blah, blah, blah. It starts up again. So 
the, the danger with these kind of teachings is that you, then you try to get rid of thought. But the silence of knowing is not the silence of no thought. It's the silence of knowing. And to get there, you have to allow yourself the fact that that worry is like this, or planning is like this. So like right now, we're just starting our building project. And um, there's a great big pit out here now. And it's very exciting, but it's also very frightening <laughs> because it costs a lot of money and the prices are just going through the roof, right? So we had a meeting today and we had a meeting yesterday. And what does that do? That stimulates thought. How could it do anything like that? So then I know, oh, with a meeting about planning and finances, there are thoughts about planning and finances. It's natural. Rather than, you know, when I'm meditating, then I'll have no thought. Shut up. But that's impossible. Having stimulated intellect and, 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 and dealing with problems, the mind will have an echo of thought. It's natural. So then I meditate, I notice so thoughts come up about this or that. But that's not, that's not a problem. If, I'm, if I truly understand what witnessing is, it's just natural. But if I'm, a, if I'm a kind of card-carrying Buddhist meditator, then I just meditate, focus on samadhi or whatever I call that, on the breath, and I try to get rid of thought. It's a disaster. It really is. Now, just sitting there and planning the finances for an hour, that's useless as well. So I take refuge in knowing, oh, I, I recognize, oh, this is planning. Planning feels this way, which isn't a repression of thought. It's stepping back to the spiritual witnessing of thought as thought. Very hard to do again. So one of the things that, that you find anyone recommends is, is that when you awaken to the fact that, like if I awaken to the fact that I'm planning something, I'm not aware of it, I see myself planning, because like this. And then if I'm really anxious, then, oh, anxiety feels like this. So someone near us so went to town three days ago. We need to get some uh, sheets of three-quarter inch ply, bolted ply, which we use a lot. And he just checked out the shop. It was about 150 bucks a sheet or something. And did buy it. Three days later, he comes back, he buys it, but it's $20 more in three days. And the abbot and he said, what? No, stop building. Let's make a goldfish pond. <laughs> and that's known as fear or, or panic. And then I know, oh, yeah, this is worry. Worry feels this way. And then we had a meeting and we talked about it. We said, yeah, let's go for it. We'll be right. But due diligence, we do due diligence, we do that and, and think about it. But I could see in my heart, was, oh gosh, what's going to happen? And is that wrong? Should I as a monk, who, I've been a monk for a long time, should I be some kind of block of rock that I never feel anything? No, I'm, I have emotions and, and I have feelings. This is very natural, but, but I'm not gonna take refuge in those emotions. I've done that enough. I can take refuge in knowing. Then you get past the idea of repression. If you don't do that, you, then you're always just trying to get rid of these things. Oh, no, I have to focus on the breath. Or I have to do metta bhavana as a way of actually getting rid of. Not that those are bad in themselves, but when the intention is to get rid of something, they won't work. But recognizing what is there. Oh, this is fear. Or this is worry. Okay. Then I, okay. There's worry. What can I do? I can do this. I can do that. Fine. That's rational. But my awareness then is is my 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 my. Uh, that's what I hold to awareness. And this way, worldly worldly uh, things become dharma practice. You know the 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 idea of a monk or a nun is not just shaven headed folk that wear funny clothing and. and don't eat in the afternoon or things like that, but rather they are archetypes. A monk or a nun are archetypes of spiritual aspiration. That's what they were meant to be in society. The, 
the fourth heavenly message, the aspiration to Nibban, the aspiration to peace, to freedom. And, and then the monastery is also kind of a, a model of a place of spiritual practice. Now, we still have worldly considerations. We still get flat tires and, and someone has to cook the food and, and there are finances to, to, to look at and so on. So it's still, world is still going on. You don't get away from that, obviously. But the whole point of the exercise of monastery is the sustaining of the heart of awareness. So then the very problems that we have in and building a, a big building is problematic. It can't be anything but that becomes a practice. And it's the practice of due diligence and care, but it's also the practice of awareness of the way things are. Then the building project is a monastery. Then family is a monastery. Then work is a monastery then sickness is a monastery because they're all different worldly situations we're in, but our, our focus is not just completing the task in a, in a, in a reasonable way, but also taking refuge in awareness. And, and that just makes you stronger. So I, I, I look at something and, and it kind of oh, freaks me out a bit. Oh, this is what it feels like to be nervous or anxious. What can I do? What can I not do? So the spiritual life is all the time. It's 24-7, all the time. And then a lot of these problematic things actually are much more meaningful. I don't want them. You know, I, I'd rather just, we could just go, boink, Dharma Hall's done. But I don't quite, I haven't figured out how to do that. Yet. You know, we have to do something more complicated called building work. But all of the building work isn't just about an end point, is it? It has to be about mindfulness and awareness and awakening to the way things are. And then at the end of it, not only hopefully do we have a good building, but we have good human beings, wise human beings, uh, a community which is uh, not, in, not in discord, but a community which is uh, in accord with what has been done. And that's the way Ajahn Chah always taught us. You know, he, he quite often, he'd have work projects. Like sometimes we'd have nothing. In the monastery, you just have all, all day, it's too much space. Just meditate on your own hour after hour after hour. And then you'd have 12 hours a day work projects in the heat. And you say, oh, I want to meditate. And then, of course, when you were, didn't have a work project, I want to work. And he would just play around like that. But it was all meditation. A lot of work, uh, exhaustion. Sometimes he would, um, like, sunset at, you know at Wapa Pong was around six in the evening and you think oh finally I can have a shower and I don't have to do any construction work he he had this massive generator and he got the lights going and 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 he said oh well a few more hours come on and three hours four hours and the mind would be grumbling and complaining I didn't come here for this this is ridiculous and the suttas it says monks should be sitting under a tree and meditating grumble, 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 and he would smile <laughs> and say, how are you doing? <laughs> Suffering, are you? Uh, and so he never, he never let us just uh, define meditation as some posture or some disengagement with society in, in, in some kind of abstract way. No, real life. And, 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 and I really, I'm really grateful for that because I wasn't taught a technique in meditation, I was always encouraged, awaken to the way things are, because that's the true spiritual uh, opening. And then when you when you abide in that opening, in that, because it is an opening, isn't it? Like when I witness sound, I'm now open to awareness. When I'm fascinated by sound, I'm with sound, which is fine. But if I don't do this, I'm never open to the silence of the moment. But if I begin to do that and have a taste for that, I think, wow, it's vast. It's spacious, it's loving. If we can just sustain that witnessing of the way things are. So I've kind of talked a lot. Uh, I'll leave that for your reflection. Any questions? So <laughs> Sadhu, Sadhu, 
Any questions, Peter, that we have? Uh, we'd like to now open the floor and invite everyone uh, to ask any questions, provide any comments or feedback, or just say something to Lompo. Uh, feel free to click on the raise hand button. And, uh, that's Malika. Yes, that's Malika. Malika, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hi, Malika. Hi, happy birthday, Ajahn. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Ajahn Karunuko is still at Dhammagiri. Oh, is he? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So they gave a chant, a blessing for you on your birthday. Oh, thank you. I feel <laughs> blessed to pieces. <laughs> Ajahn, you were talking about stillness of knowing. And uh, how does it relate to sound of silence i hear that well, all the time yeah lompa tomato just for others lompa tomato teaches a lot i used to probably less now but um just malik i'll give a background of where that's coming from so in in, in the indian tradition you have something called nada yoga nada is sound yeah. and and lompa tomato when he was in Hampstead Bihara, 1977, 78, um, he, well, he, as, as a young novice, he had, in his meditations, began to notice a very high-pitched, almost electronic sound, which I think most of us have noticed, when he was meditating. And then he sort of forgot, didn't use it much, and then when he was in, in Hampstead in London, where we spent two years in London, uh, he was walking along a very busy street, Haverstock Hill. And the sound was really powerful, very powerful. So he decided to use that as a way of exploring silence, exploring consciousness. And he used it a lot and would um, listen to that even in, in complex situations, he'd be in the, in the tube in, in, in London and listening to it uh, where there were loud noises and so on. That became a kind of grounding for him. So, so the sound of silence is not something that you should seek because otherwise you become greedy, but it is a sign of the mind resting in, in peace and silence and emptiness. And some people, for some people, it's a very a powerful thing. For some people, it's uh, annoying. Some people ask, is it tinnitus? Tinnitus, whatever way you pronounce that. But uh, Malika, just for you, that that when when there is the know, you know, when you abide as the knowing, and you rest in that, and you allow sound consciousness to be there, quite often you'll notice that. Then use that as a way of just keeping the mind resettled into the spaciousness of receptivity. So it's not the same. It's for me. It's a sign of wholesome, um, wholesome presence that helps to sustain that wholesome presence. So it's not the same as like hearing the robins outside or 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 uh, hearing some chanting. It's 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 not like that. And so the way to use that is to heighten or or emphasize the knowing. If you emphasize the knowing, then that sound can be very helpful because it's it's a very kind of um, it's very vast and spacious, and you can abide as that vast spaciousness, and gives you a sense that awareness is not really concentration on an object. It's open, it's it's receptive, and sustaining that can be very helpful to cultivate that attitude. Having said that, if you try to look for it as an experience, if it's not there naturally, you can get caught up into thinking you have to get it. And as soon as you do that, you're in desire. And when you're in desire, you're in disaster. <laughs> so um, I would say if in, if in like an open, open awareness or receptive awareness, it's noticed, then abide as witness to that. Allow that to be an indicator that the practice is in a good place. And if it's not there, don't worry. Don't, don't worry about it. 
Some people have a real affinity to it. Some people use it a lot. Some people don't. I just made it taught that for, for many, many years. But people did sometimes get hung up on it by trying to find it. Or then they became conceited. I've got it. Have you? Which is silly. Um, so it really is, 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 is a kind of indicator of, of silent presence. That's what you're always emphasizing, silent presence, witnessing. Does that help? Malika? Yeah, Ajani, so uh, it's always in the background. So, yes. So it's okay, isn't it? Because then I, then I come back to my breath and, and just ignore it. Just use that. Just use the background. Okay. You know, you can experiment with that. Just be the background. Is the word. What is the background? Okay. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really worth experimenting with that, where you don't always have to focus on the breath, say. Okay. The thing is, you know, sometimes yeah. in meditation, you, you kind of think you have to do one way, but awareness yeah. is very free to experiment. So I, I would kind of say, well, what, what if I just abide as background, play around with that? Yeah, because it's always there and that's exactly. it's bothering me. And, and I, I feel that I have to go back to my breath. Now, now Not I understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, now I understand. Yeah, look at look at any kind of um, compulsions or or almost duty. I must watch my breath. They're yeah. they're the kind of leftover of technique oriented practices, which were good in the beginning. Yeah, but now you you know you're beyond that now. You can let go of the techniques okay. because techniques can can also be very much conjoined with a sense of me doing. And you want to more and more liberate the me doing to just knowing. Yeah. yeah? So I would experiment. Yeah. Be yeah. yeah. Even now I can hear it. I can feel it. <laughs> then then so, that, ex yeah, ex explore yeah. that. It would be good. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you. All right. David, you're next, I think. I got your letter. Thank you. Mute. There you go. I think uh, Glenda wants to say, ask you a question. Hello. Okay, Glenda. Hi. I just. Hi, Glenda. Hi. I'm really in. Um, I'm really feeling moved by your teachings and presence. And um, in terms of knowing, knowingness, connecting, just pure knowingness, um, can there be like a a feeling of compassion? along with knowingness, like compassionate knowingness, or is compassion more a feeling and that's still an object? Good question. <clears throat> I think they do come together, but <clears throat> if you equate it to too strong a feeling, then you try to find the feeling. But I think abiding, what I find is when I go to the question of who am I, then it goes right to the heart. And the heart feels very open and is an abiding in awareness. Um, if I try to get that, this kind of compassionate feeling, then it doesn't work because it's a me trying to go there. So it seems to me the more there is the letting go of a me and, and there's a direct uh, observation of the sense of me, actually, it's interesting. Then the heart has a kind of openness and, and a sense of, yeah, this is right. This is appropriate. Um, now, if, however, I, I'm annoyed at something going on, and then I think I should be compassionate, that's a disaster. Because that's a rejection of this feeling of annoyance, which also needs compassion. But if I go to the feeling, well, who is feeling annoyed? then there's an openness of mind to accept the annoyance as just another object. And so compassion, it seems to me, or love or whatever you want, is the perfection of awareness. Because, well, maybe that's not well put. How do I put it? That, that awareness accepts all things and rejects none. One way to put it. That's intellectually, right? We can understand that. But what would that be like? as an embodied being. And it seems to me it would be in this way of open-heartedness. Um, so 
I would explain, like, Linda, I would experiment with that and see what is compassion beyond the, or love or whatever, what is it beyond the individual references to love that we have? So I see uh, a grandchild and there's a loving feeling to the grandchild. Well, those are very obvious, but what would it be if it wasn't designated by a person or a me? What would that be? What would that openness be like? And the way I get there is by, like, when my mind is, like, let's say, I, like, I started to panic about the cost of, of plywood sheets. And, and then the sense, strong sense of self comes up, right? And then I say, well, who is thinking? And that takes me right to the heart. I've done this a lot, so it's kind of, you know, it, it's easy for me. So I'd experiment with that. Now, our... In Theravada Buddhism, we say that the, we talk about the unshakable deliverance of the heart. And in the heart, I would say, is what we call the Brahma Viharas, which are metta, which is uh, loving kindness, karuna, which is compassion, mudita, which is joy, and upika, which is peace. And, and these four are, are the, the, the dynamic response to, to the world of a freed heart, of a liberated heart, of the unshakable deliverance of the heart. And they're dynamic because you don't always feel compassion. Sometimes you feel joy. You know, the kind of nuances of love, shall we say. And that's the way it's phrased in Theravada Buddhism. But it is an open-heartedness. So when you when you see your, your, your grandchild, or if you have a grandchild, and, and the grandchild has just made a drawing for you, said, you know, of a sunset, and it's definitely Picasso, right? And you feel so so much joy at the grandchild's creativity. And then the grandchild falls and bruises its knee and feels so much compassion. So it's dynamic, but it's very loving. It's very open in that way. And that's what I think hopefully we get to in this, in this sense of knowing that it's not just cerebral. It's not just the head knowing stuff that it's, it's, it's very much grounded in, in, in a pure presence from the heart, from the body, those kinds. Of, so it's a very good question, actually, to kind of height, uh, emphasize that. Now, in, in Theravada Buddhism, we tend sometimes to make the practices of what we call metta bhavana, practices of loving kindness, a kind of prayerful thing. So we say, you know, may my granny be well, and may my neighbors be well, and I send the metta. That's the language that we have. But that's very dualistic language. There's a me and there's a them. Another way to look at that is their stream of consciousness. And a stream of consciousness, there is a, there's a possibility of freedom through uh, open-hearted awareness. And that's what you begin to incline towards. It's not about other people, it's about the heart being open. And when the heart closes, you, you, that, that, the reference of awareness is, well, why is that? Why is the heart closed down? It might close down through self-disparagement. You know, you have a memory of, of something that you did, which was, which was clumsy, and then the memory comes up and the heart <sighs> closes up to guilt, self-disparagement. You become very aware of that. Oh, that's, if you're staying here in the heart, then it's not an analysis. You say, oh, yeah, that's the closed heart. What would the open heart feel like? You're right there with the action. If you, if you take it into thought, you're not with the action anymore. You're one step removed. And that one step removed can be really confusing. So say, let's say if I feel, let's say I said something uh, untowards to someone and then I remember it and a feeling of guilt comes up. Well, if I'm just with the guilt at the heart, it can't, it can't proliferate. And I'm with it, and I stay with the ugliness of that, not ugliness, the pain of that feeling, then that will open the heart, because I'm with the heart. If I take the thought, oh, it can go anywhere. It can go anywhere. Is that sort of where your territory is there? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, I find that helpful. Um... It feels like it's like um, I'm, the feeling of the heart. It's whatever's happening, whatever, whatever. There's an openness to it. Great. Right. And, Which, and, and, the, and when, if it closes down, 
you open to that closing. That's right. Like th there's endless openings and re opening, and that it, in itself feels like compassion. That there's it is that there's forever opening. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully put. And you what what you get from that is a lot of confidence because there's a rightness to it. Yeah. This is right. You know. Not, not through thought, analysis, you know that this is right, this is correct. And much of your spiritual life is guided by that sense of correctness. You know for yourself, yes, this is the path, this is correct, this works. This is, this is the fulfilling whatever. And it's not the same as, as um, you know, having a nice meal. It's a different kind of fulfillment. It's, a, it's spiritual fulfillment. It's a good question, thank you, yeah. So much. David? Okay. We're done? Thank you for the question. Okay. And we have Miri. Miri. Hi, Miri. What's the temperature in Perth? It's getting cooler now in Perth. Um, What's cool? Uh, probably maybe 18 degrees right now. Um, uh -huh. Let me just check. <laughs> So, something like it's 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 like ten degrees at night now. It's actually quite nice. Um, nice to, temperature, yeah. Much nicer to it was. It's a bit warm before. David in India, he's in a horrible heat wave. It's like over How much forty. Every so now day. it was about forty four, wasn't it? Um, yeah, North India, it's really really hot. Where where yeah. David is, it's around forty every day. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> oh, and humid a lot of the time, <laughs> so it's like being in a in a soup. So uh, but, uh, he's he's found it. He's found a. Um, I, I, he doesn't know if if she's fully enlightened, but there's somebody who's reported to be fully awakened that he's going to sit with every day, and he says he gets incredibly quiet and happy. What, where in 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 Chennai or where in, in Tiruvannamalai? Tiru, oh, Tiruvannamalai. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Nice. Uh, anyway, my question was uh, a, a, it just not not really a question, but an observation about silence, and that of um, all the all the senses like hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and um, thinking. That the silence is interesting because it's like it's like the absence of sound is like an active presence in a way. Um, so we we don't. We don't have any sense of no sight. We don't say sightless <laughs> or tasteless, <laughs> but we say that the, the silence. And I find of all the sense modalities, it's it's the absence of the sound that seems to most positively touch on that awareness. And instead of say quietness, or they say a quiet mind and the, the, the silence. And and for for me, it's not even the the nada that that high pitched it's 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 behind that and it feels like best right. way to describe it when when it, when it becomes um, salient it's like a cushion of of silence and and it's underneath all the sound everything that's happening. Yeah, it's beyond the nada, isn't it? It's beyond the nada. Yeah. The nada is still an object. It's still still you know it's in yeah. their head it's still. This is I, I found that I, I didn't use the nada much in my own practice. Lompo Semedo used it a lot. Yeah. yeah. But he doesn't talk about it much now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good, good reflection. And you're you're pretty proficient at that? No, no. <laughs> I have a I have a lot of problem with with uh just thoughts just keep 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 arising um so i'm 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 if the more i do it the, the better it gets so after um a retreat or something i i'm it's much more salient but um yes with with meditation i'm still trying to find a way to get to just not take the thoughts seriously, just they, they keep hijacking, they keep distracting, they keep saying, look at right. me, look at me, and, um, and I say, go away. And then you also, know. you're you, being an academic, you're stimulating that realm a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's, so, that's right. And I'm also writing on that in my 
philosophy. I'm trying to build a metaphysical system <laughs> around it. So, like, the door here is so data, and then next thing I'm trying to, yeah. So, but so you, yes. were, you were doing a, you were going to do a, a, a book on Advaita and Theravada. Is that the book? Yeah, yeah, that's I'm, I it's a long term project. I'm I'm very very slow. Um, it takes me a long time. I'm, I think I go to half the speed. I'm like the slow modem of philosophers. I'm I'm not a fast internet. My mind. <laughs> it takes me a long time to to just figure figure stuff out. So this has been going years. I mean, I'm hoping in my lifetime it'll get done. <laughs> that's modest. <laughs> Well, you don't want to come back and do it again, do you? No, no, no. I want to. I want to come back and then and then um, read read his work by. Oh, who's this Mary Albahari? I have a resonance <laughs> with her work. That's that, that's that a good. Well, anyway, I'm going to live to be 120, so you better get it done by then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, happy birthday as well! And uh, yeah, thank you, Mary. You might press the day. Yeah. I will. If you find it, what, what's the name of the of the um, Swami's name? If you could send me her name. Her name is Gangama. Gangama. Gang no one because knows. Amara Siri is going to be in. Um, mm -hmm. Amara is going to be in Tiruvannamalai in uh, January with his mother. Oh, all right. So, so she's at the moment. It's at a stage where there's not that many people. So it's not right. not standing room only yet. So David just goes every day. He's a bit, he says lots of people ask silly questions, um, but he just sits there and bathes in the in the quietness. Oh, sounds great! Yeah. And he's, he's, his mind becomes naturally incredibly quiet, still and happy um, through her presence. In her in her presence, and he he right. he doesn't want to commit himself to saying that she's a nyani, which is like the equivalent of the, of the arahant, but. Uh, he says the more he, he goes, the, the, the more telling signs there are. And one of the signs, he says, is, you know, how quiet you are in their presence. So he sat with Maharaj and Papaji and um, um, Lakshmana Swami. And in all of their presence, he felt very quiet. And so this is mm. um, the, yeah. And, and, but she's not well known about. You can't Google her or anything like that. She's um, still a, a well-kept secret uh, in um yes that's the that's the beauty of india yeah produces these wonderful beings yeah well give them my best when you i i right, will yeah. i will okay. nice chat bye mary okay Bita. are we done or okay now paul um there are no more questions from the floor long paul okay and shall we shall we close by chanting the words of loving kindness, Long Paul? Yes, that would be nice. You want me to lead? Uh, yes. Or do you want to lead? <laughs> no, no. Please lead. I'll lead. Okay. We'll do it from here, <clears throat> nice and loud. <clears throat> and you got it on the screen there. <clears throat> This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later approve, wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting not the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. 
Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and undoubted, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you, Bita, for hosting us, as always. Thank you so much, Lung Po. And um, may we all now please pay respects uh, to you, Lung Po, as we take leave from you. And sending you all the well wishes to... You're not going to get tired of all this bowing, Bita. No. Huh? We will bow till your hundred... It's good, it's good for the spine. Okay, let's go for it. <laughs> all right, so please let, let us all now put our palms together and with, with rejoice in our hearts um, that we now please uh, pay respects to the venerable one. Let's bow. Second bow. Final bow. Take care, Long Pa. Okay, nice to be with you. See you next time. Okay, Ciao. Bye. Don't worry, be happy.